Good morning. Good morning. Well, you guys are awake this morning. Surprise, considering we all lost an hour last night. Man. Um, one, of a, one of the a preacher's uh, least favorite Sundays uh, is daylight savings time. Uh, grateful for more sunshine. Thank you, Lord, that we get more sunshine. But also, I am none thankful for the archaic practice that we are continuing to perpetuate as a society. Um, please make me king, Lord, so that uh, in my kingdom uh, there will be no more daylight savings time. We can just be done with this nonsense. Uh, sincerely, Caleb. Amen. Um, if you have your Bible, open to Matthew chapter 5. Uh, we were coming to the end of the road here on our uh, study of the Beatitudes. Um, and, uh, you know, I've said uh, throughout the, the, the course of this series that, uh, you know, Jesus is painting a picture of uh, discipleship. You know, many people look at the Beatitudes and they get really depressed because they look at it as sort of like a thing of like, I've got to do this. I've got to become poor. Um, and uh, really Jesus is, is, is talking about the conditions of the heart, uh, the conditions of, the, of a person's character, uh, what the, the output of their life uh, in Jesus Christ actually looks like. Uh, so he's painting this portrait of discipleship. And... Um, we, uh, I meant, there I go, back in the, I see many of you looking at the screen, uh, and your eyes are like, where do you go? <laughs> I'm here. Um, the, uh, when we think about, uh, d d so, where was I? Oh, Beatitudes, <laughs> that's right. So in the Beatitudes, uh, Jesus is painting this picture, and um, he's not pulling uh, these things out of thin air. We've seen this over the last six weeks where he's, he's actually really pointing to something that has uh, uh, deep roots within the Old Testament. Um, it's a part of God's character, his nature. It's part of his design for, for humanity. And so Jesus is, is uh, uh, summarizing huge passages of the Old Testament into these little pithy statements. And... Um, you know, he's, he's pointing to the fact that if you, like this, this as, as we embrace this type of lifestyle as a disciple of Jesus, the, there is a, a blessing that comes along with it, and the blessing is God himself. Um, as we approach this one, this is, I said several weeks ago, that there's one, there's one beatitude that does not have any connection to the Old Testament and has uh, very, very little connections to the New Testament. Um, we're here, okay? It is peacemaker. This is the one beatitude where Jesus is not pulling uh, anything out of the Old Testament. Actually, um, it seems as though Jesus makes up a word here. It, it really, it, the, he is like putting, he's taking two uh, Greek words and he's sandwiching them together and he's smashing them together, so creating a compound word. And this is, this is the only time in the whole Bible where this word is actually used. And the word, peacemaker. Isn't that interesting that he actually made up a word to describe something that he was actually, you know, talking about is, you know, making peace. It's, it's very sort of ironic um, that he, he made up something that, uh, anyway, we'll just go on. You don't think that was very funny. The, the two words that he put together, um, these are the things, just so you know, these are the things that I just sort of like, as I read the Gospels or read the Bible, I, I find myself chuckling because there's, there's always, sometimes like the, the authors, you know, just sort of like sprinkle in a, a little dose of, uh, of irony or a little dose of, um, you know, sarcasm and, uh, or, or rhetoric. You know, Paul does this quite frequently where he will, will say something in, a, in a, a certain way or he'll write something in a certain way. And um, it is, is actually like a, a rhetorical Statement like he is making, he's sort of poking at their mindset. Anyway, so I laugh, I laugh when I see those things because I'm a Bible nerd. Um, and in the spirit of Bible nerd, I'm going to put you tell you what uh, two words that Jesus was putting together. So the word here is irene poi, epoyo poio, 
okay? So uh, don't try and say that, but it is sort of like Spanish for chicken. Um, you know, pollo, right? Pollo, 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 oyo. Uh, Irene, o pollo, o oyo is the word. Um, it means peace making, and it's the combination of the two words. Um, if Jesus here is not referring back to the Old Testament, um, what is he, con- he what is he referencing? Well, who's, what's he talking about? I mean, this is, did he just, you know, sort of just make this thing up or not? And I can assure you, he did not. Um, the most, well, all of what he said was inspired by the Holy Spirit. Um, it was the Spirit talking through him. But uh, in this instance, it wasn't that the Spirit was pointing back to something in the Old Testament. Actually, the Spirit here is talking and pointing to something that's happening in the midst of the culture around Jesus. And so to really understand this, we, we have to kind of take a dive down a rabbit hole. Um, and actually, because we're going to talk about rabbis, we're going to go down a rabbi hole. Oh, I've been waiting all week to use that one. Oh. Okay, so this is a tale of two rabbis. If it was a tale of two rabbits, it would be a T A I L of two rabbits. Ah, uh, oh, yeah, that's dad jokes. Uh, next, I'm going to go. So, two rabbis walked into a bar. Uh, no. Anyway, moving on. So, uh, one of the things that we don't often think about when we read the Gospels is that uh, Jesus was interacting with, with some of his contemporaries. Um, we, we see this a lot. Actually, a lo- lot of the huge sections of the Sermon on the Mount is, uh, is, is Jesus actually engaging with uh, the contemporary rabbinical thought of the day. Uh, when he is giving his, his commentary on the law in uh, chapters 6 and 7, um, he is, uh, he's engaging with what was contemporary thought about certain issues of the day. And um, he, would, he would basically take a concept that was, uh, existed in the, 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 the tradition or the contemporary thinking and he would uh, he attach a rocket to it, light it, and launch it into the, to, to another dimension, a dimension that people didn't even think existed. And so he'd launch it out there, and then you know, people would go, ooh, ah, Jesus, you teach with such authority. That's, that was their statement of, ooh, and ah, like we can't believe the level of depth that you are bringing to the table here. This is amazing. And so those, those instances of Jesus is challenging the thinking of uh, the, the Jewish class people, the, the religious uh, establishment, uh, we'll call it uh, Temple Inc., would you say? Uh, it's basically that there was a, an established religion within the land of Judah at the time and everything was run by the temple and um, the, the temple basically told people what to think. This is what to think about this type of issue. And that actually wasn't anything new. Uh, this had been going on for hundreds of years at this point. Um, but Jesus here is actually engaging um, in an ongoing debate about peace. And um, cancel. the rabbis that he's addressing, they lived about a generation before Jesus. And they're basically, um, they represent the two main schools of, thought, of thinking within the New Testament. And again, you see Jesus interacting with these two different um, schools um, and um, the one one school was a very very strict form of teaching the Torah and so when they they interpreted the Torah and they looked at the Torah and every like they were they were teaching and all this like they were instructing people, uh, this school would have um, used the tightest language possible, right? And and it was it was all nuanced, but it was as 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 airtight as it could be, and at times it didn't even make sense. Like there was a there was a. Uh, 
a debate, and this was an actual debate. There was a debate on how to light the Hanukkah candles. Yes, there was. There was a debate. And the, the, strict, the strict people were like, no, 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 you, to, to not violate any sort of like the religious thing, what you need to do is you need to light them all first and then every day you need to light one less because um, that is, uh, as you progress, progress through the, the holy time, that is doing the least harm. You're like, is it really? Like, but then the other school was a, a very sort of, you know, compassionate, you know, approach to the law, said the complete opposite, that actually what you do is when you light the candles, you should light one, and one on the first day, and then the second day, light two, and then, you know, and basically as you work towards the Sabbath, uh, it basically ensures, uh, the first view ensures that you do as little work as possible on the Sabbath, and then the last one is you're actually working very hard on the Sabbath, and you shouldn't be doing that. So... Um, anyway, those are the, the two sort of, you know, views that happened. Um, one uh, was run by a guy named Shammai, and the other one was run by a guy named Hillel. Hillel uh, was the more compassionate one. He was... Uh, one that said, you know what, let's, uh, let's take a more, uh, you know, let's, let's adhere to the law, but let's not do it at the expense of our common sense. He was more practical. And uh, Hillel was the grandfather of a guy named Gamaliel. And you see Gamaliel in Acts chapter five, uh, bring some of that, you know, grandfatherly common sense to the table. Uh, hold that thought, we'll talk about that. Um, the differences between these two basically is there was a convert who was seeking to, um, to, to come into Judaism, right? And so he comes to, first to Shammai, and Shammai, uh, he asked Shammai, uh, okay, I'm going to stand on one foot, and I, what I want you to do is I want you to teach me the, the Torah, and so what does Shammai do? He is the, he's the guy that is, you know, very uh, strict, restrictive, um, you know, airtight, uh, non-compassionate, non-common sense perspective of the law. Uh, Shammai picks up a stick and he beats the guy. That's, that's, what, that's what it says. That's the, the tradition. He picked up a stick and he started beating the guy. He said, be gone. So that was basically his perspective on the law and the Torah. <laughs> and uh, the, the, the convert, the guy who's seeking to, con to convert into Judaism or to become a God-fearer, a proselyte, he, he goes to Hillel and Hillel um, doesn't pick up a stick. Hillel uh, says this. What you do while the guy's standing on one foot, I'll stand on one foot. Hillel said, what you do not want someone to do to you, do not do to them. That is the whole Torah. While the rest is commentary thereof, now go and learn it. The guy puts his foot down and he walks off. What did that sound like? Who did that sound like? Je Jesus, right? I mean, this, what you do not want, this is the, the essence of, of Hillel's teaching, was that what you do not want someone to do to you, do not do to them. That sounds like Jesus. It actually sounds like Matthew 7, 12, where Jesus is giving us the golden rule. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. For this fulfills the law and the prophets, as Jesus says. Now, Jesus gives us the positive of Hillel's negative because neg the, the Hillel gives us kind of a negative. But the, here's the thing, like when you really sit down and think about it, these two statements sound alike, but they're not alike. They're not actually the same thing because not doing something is different than doing something, right? So the difference, and that was one of those statements where Jesus, where all the people were like, they heard Jesus like, oh, wow, he said that? He is one who speaks with such authority. Ooh, he just lit the rocket, launched it into outer space. And they're amazed. On peace, Shammai, who was more restrictive, uh, according to the Mishnah, um, this is what he said. Say little, 
but do much and receive all men with pleasant countenance. That was his, that was his idea of peace. It was just basically, what did he say? What does he say? He says, um, greet people with a smile on your face. Right? That's easy. That's easy. Say little, but do much. Receive all men with a pleasant countenance. Hillel says this, and this is, this is where Jesus sort of points to in the, the, the last beatitude here. Or the, not the last. The seventh beatitude. He says, be of the disciples of Aaron, loving peace and pursuing peace, loving mankind and drawing them close to the Torah. That's completely different than Shammai, isn't it? Again, this, these two, these, are, this was the, these, these guys had the most influence on the Jewish people that Jesus was speaking to. They, they did. So like you could have divided the, the hill. He's on the mount. Divide the hill down the middle and you would have one group in the Hillel camp and you would have one group in the Shammai camp. Now, here's the interesting thing is that while these two guys were living a generation before Jesus, they, they represented two completely different ideologies about the Torah. And the, the interesting thing was is that they actually, they lived in peace. They promoted peace amongst their followers. But the, the problem was is once they died, what happened? It bl- all blew up. And so uh, those two schools basically created two camps, two ideologies, two divisions, and they radically opposed each other. They were fighting it out in the streets. There was no peace among them. And so along comes Jesus and he starts talking about these, these things that these people are fighting about. And what's he doing in the midst of it? He's wowing people. He's bringing peace to a part of religious life where there was no peace. There was nothing but conflict. But on peace, Jesus is doing something that is really, really unique because um, he's sort of in a way pointing to Aaron's thought, right? So what does it mean to be a disciple of Aaron? So the, um, the, the Mishnah and the Talmud are these uh, ancient uh, Jewish documents. They weren't documents in the beginning at the time of Jesus. They were part of the oral tradition. And basically all of it was a commentary on uh, the scriptures, and so within uh, Jewish circles and within uh, the synagogues, uh, they would read scripture and then they would talk about the commentary from uh, the oral tradition, what they, they had known, which basically means that whoever was talking in the synagogue at the time had uh, everything that they were saying orally transmitted to them from another person. Isn't that interesting? That's... That, for me, 2,000 years removed from that or 2,500 years, that's so difficult for me to get my mind around. But when you think about what didn't they have in the, in the first century? What didn't they have in the, you know, 6th century BC? Well, they didn't have TVs. They didn't have, you know, very little forms of entertainment. There was, you know, acting and stage, you know, drama and all that stuff. But, but, they had a, I think that they had a, a, a part of their brain that was being used that we don't necessarily use today. Yeah. Yes, obviously. I mean, if you, if you, if you, like the fact that they, they had, they had two thirds of this book completely memorized. I, I spend a lot of time reading this book and I have, you know, I can't recite it cover to cover. I, I know you, you have such high hopes for me to do that, <laughs> but I don't. So, but they were able to just like, what does is, what is Isaiah 55 say? And they just, boom, 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 boom. They had it memorized. And so they had the, the, the Mishnah and the, um, 
the, the commentary, the Talmud, uh, and there's another one, Gemara, Gemara I think, and, and there was basically these three things make up this, this oral commentary on the history of Israel and the traditions and different teachings and different uh, applications of the law, practical stuff. Um, and so people would go to synagogue and they would, they would hear scripture and then they would hear this. Um, what it says about Aaron is really, really unique. And this is where, where, this is where Hill, Hillel kind of draws his conclusion from. So Aaron, you know, it says in the, the Talmud that when Aaron was, you know, Aaron, there were many children. It says this, many children were named for Aaron because Aaron resolved many quarrels amongst husbands and wives. That's one of the things it says. So he was, he was a, a peace man between spouses. He was the peace man between uh, husbands and wives. And so they would come to him and they would, you know, get counsel from him and then they would go off and they would have a baby. All things were good. He solved the problem. It says that when, when two people were fighting, one of the things that Aaron would do is that he would go to one and he would report that the other person was very sorrowful for the conflict and that he wanted to seek reconciliation. And the person that he told that to would go, oh, that's very interesting. And then Aaron would leave and he would go to the other person that that person was in conflict with and he would tell them the same thing, that so-and-so over there is very sorrowful for the conflict and he's, he's remorseful and he wants to reconcile and he wants to have peace. And that person would go, oh, that's great. And then the two people, Aaron would leave and the two people would go and they would meet each other. And it says they would set their differences aside and make peace. How many of you see the ethical dilemma in that? You see it, right? Like Aaron, I can, when, you, when you read it, you're like, wait a minute, is it okay to lie to people? This was, this was Aaron's way. Another thing it says is that, uh, and this was, this was really interesting to me when I, when I read this, that Aaron, according to tradition, um, when Israel was making the golden calf, so this was the brother, remember, the brother of Moses, right? He was the, the first priest of Israel. He was uh, of the tribe of Levi. Uh, he was established the whole priestly lineage. But there was this one incident where Moses was up on the mountain getting the commandments from the Lord and Aaron is down on the ground and the people are growing restless and anxious and uh, they, they say to Aaron, hey, let's, let's build a golden calf because then we will have a God that we can see. Now this is the commentary. Aaron went along with this because he wanted to keep the peace among the people, number one, and he also wanted to teach them a lesson by taking all of their gold and turning it into a calf so that after the incident, the people would have no gold. That's what it says. Isn't that interesting? So that was like, he was, he was a person of peace and he sought peace in creative ways. And he sought to teach things in creative ways according to the, the Talmud, according to, to Jewish tradition. The point of all of it, and there's many more stories, the point of all of it is that Aaron, throughout all of Israel, for, from generation to generation to generation, and up until the present, he's still seen as a person of peace. And this is what Psalm 133 sort of draws upon. Remember Psalm 133? Anybody quote Psalm 133 out there? You're like, uh. You know this, how good and pleasant it is when God's people live together in unity. You know this Psalm, right? You've heard this? Yeah? It's like the precious oil poured on, on the head of, on the head, running down on the beard and running down on Aaron's beard down on the collar of his robe. That's 133 verses one and two, right? So the psalmist sort of relates here that the unity or unity 
was an anointing that Aaron carried. You see it? So the oil represents anointing. Blessed are those brothers who dwell together in unity, for it is like the anointing oil that is poured upon Aaron. His anointing is relating to peace. And so throughout Israel and throughout all of Israel's history, Aaron is seen as this guy of peace. And Hillel is saying, look, you Israel, he's teaching this to his, his camp. You Israel, be followers, be disciples of Aaron. Be known for peace. So the most popular teaching on peace, which was Hillel's, points towards being a disciple of Jesus and, or uh, of Aaron. And then Jesus comes along and he basically here in this beatitude says, no, 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 no. Your, your thinking and your teaching and the way you understand uh, the way you should live your life as a person of peace is based upon Aaron. And Jesus says no to that. He actually says that your peacemaking is not based on being a follower of Aaron, but your peacemaking should be based on being a son or daughter of God. You see that? Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Not the followers of Aaron, but they should be called the children of God. So he's, Jesus is taking the, the common uh, out, out, or, uh, outlook on peace and being a peacemaker, and he's turning it on its head and saying, no, 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 no. And, uh, which is interesting because he's talking about discipleship. I mean, he's, I mean, go back to what I said in the beginning. He's painting a picture of discipleship. And here, here almost at the very end, he, he sort of takes a, a sharp left-hand turn and says, now, 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 now. You think that I'm painting a picture of you, what it looks like to really follow me. But what I'm really doing is I'm painting a picture of what it looks like to be a child of God. John 1. For those who believe in Jesus shall receive the right to be called children of God. It all comes together. It all just, it's there. It's a part of the, the package. So peacemaking comes from sonship of your heavenly father, not your discipleship of Aaron is what Jesus is saying. Not the Levite. I would, I would even venture to say, go, go far enough that um, our, our discipleship is based upon following Jesus. But here, Jesus is giving us a caveat that says, your peacemaking is not part of your discipleship with following me with your whole life. Your, dis your peacemaking comes with the territory of being a child of God. Are you with me? He, he takes it a step further. Again, Jesus is known for you know, taking, taking the idea, attaching a rocket to it, lighting it, and going, whoosh. There we go. Launch into the outer atmosphere. He just did that here. He just launched it to, to the outer limits. And here's, the, here's the, the truth about all of this, right? So peacemaking. So, okay, we got, where does, what's Jesus talking about? Where, where, where did he get this idea from? And it's, it's kind of challenging to think about Jesus being influenced by um, extra biblical, you can call it extra biblical sources. Like he was influenced by other rabbis and some of his teachings actually were based upon his contemporaries. And that, and that hard, that's a hard pill to swallow, is it? It kind of feels like it. And the reason, you know, the reason for that is because we have this underlying presupposition as Christians that everything Jesus said came solely from the Holy Spirit. Like, I, I don't, hear me, I'm not going to discount the, the Spirit in Jesus. Like, the Spirit in Jesus and God, they're all, all the same. Um, all part of the Trinity. 
But it's interesting to think about how the Spirit working several generations before Jesus actually paved the way for Jesus to kind of set up and say what he did. Isn't that interesting? The, the Spirit of God has, has been working throughout all of history to, G, to get to Jesus so that you and I could get Jesus and complete the story. That's what you're looking at. Anyway. Peacemaking... When it comes to peacemaking, peace, this world that we live in is, is in desperate need of peacemakers. Wouldn't you say? Can I get an amen? Amen, a, amen and a hallelujah. Throw your hats in the air. Wave some handkerchiefs. Like our world is in desperate need of peacemaking because we live in a world of conflict. There is constant conflict. I read a study once that said in 6,000 years of human history, do you know how many years were actually non-conflict times, a grand total of 230 some years. Out of 6,000 years of human history, 230 some years were spent. And that is not, you know, in succession. That's if you take the little months and the years between wars. From the beginning of our history, humanity has been in conflict. Reminds me of the Terminator. <laughs> Terminator 2. He's talking. He's talking with the Terminator. He goes, uh, one of the things you need to know is that you guys are sort of bent on destroying yourselves. We are. Our world is in conflict. The world need, desperately needs peacemakers. But here's the thing you need to know. Peacemakers, peacemaking is um, it's just a little bit different. Our, our world knows peacekeepers, not peacemakers. But there is a difference in peacemaking and peacekeeping. Peacekeepers, what they do is they avoid or they de-escalate conflict to keep the peace. It's not actually about solving or bringing healing to any type of brokenness out there, which is what peacemakers do. They bring healing to the brokenness. They look for solutions to the brokenness. They, they, they look into, the, into the, the chaos and the rubble and they say, okay, what is, what is the systemic cause of this? And let's get to that. They're like surgeons in the midst of conflict. They're looking deep into the tissue for the problem and saying, let's solve the problem there and bring healing up to the surface. Peacekeepers are like, oh, let's just put a Band-Aid on it. Now, I will say that peacemakers or peacekeepers are, they're necessary. And in our world, I, I think they're, 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 they're vital to the protection of innocent people. And all we have to do is look back to uh, the, the genocide in Rwanda and the other genocides that are happening throughout the world currently. And we, we just said, look, the world needs, they need the peacekeepers theirs to protect innocent lives. And so peacekeepers will sometimes, they will use uh, force to protect the innocent. But that's not peacemaking. Because the peacemaking comes from deeper beneath the surface than just controlling the violence between two groups of people. So peace, peacemaking is a willingness really to, to lay down your life at the expense of of other people's flourishing or the expense of your own discomfort so that other people could flourish. Peacemaking sometimes is, un is just really just misunderstood. I, I, I know this to be true that sometimes when people engage in the peacemaking process, um, what it looks like to people who are on the outside is that they're having lunch and dinner with sinners, tax collectors, and prostitutes. So Jesus did. When Jesus was, was having dinner with a tax collector, what was he doing? He's bringing peace to Zacchaeus' life. 
when he is, when he is sitting at the table and he's, he's, he's receiving the anointing from the sinful woman, what is, what is he doing? The, the, the outsiders, the religious establishment is looking at this and he's gonna, he's gonna let a sinful woman like that anoint him with oil? What on earth is going on? And meanwhile, Jesus is sitting there bringing peace to the woman's life, bringing honor and dignity to the person's life. He's gonna let that, that outsider touch him or he's going to, to touch the person who's unclean? How can that be? And what's he doing? He's bringing peace. He's bringing ease where there's disease. And the, the people who are just sort of, you know, on looking, I, I'm telling you, in your life, it's, it's going to look like it's going to draw fire. I just, I'll tell you this, it'll, it will draw fire. When you engage in the peacemaking process and you bring, start, it's like, I'm going to bring peace to this, this, this person or this situation or this people group where there's no, there's no peace. What that's going to look like to some people is going to be like you're hanging out with the prostitutes. What are you doing? Walking the streets. Why are you, why are you there? What is wrong with you? But they don't see your intention to, in the midst of, of chaos and turmoil and discomfort and disease and sin, they don't see that you're out to make peace. Because peace, let me tell you, peace is not the, the absence of, of conflict. We're always gonna have conflict. Peace, in the biblical sense, it really is that presence of divine wisdom. It's, it's the presence of, of, of God's eyes in the midst of the situation. It's seeing it the way God sees it, seeing the problem the way God sees the problem, and being utilized in the midst of the problem to bring healing and reconciliation to the brokenness and the discord and the sinful nature of man. wisdom it's God's wisdom so what Paul says in Ephesians that and he quotes Isaiah that God he came to bring peace upon peace where there were two groups of people who were adamantly opposed to each other God steps into the middle with Jesus Christ and unites those who are one time divided. That is the Lord's peace. And that's the peace that we, as Christ followers, as disciples of Jesus, even further, the sons and the daughters of our Father in heaven, this is the peace that we are to make on earth. Are you with me? Okay. I think I'll stop there. Would you stand? You got it? Okay. For those of us, God, who are here, um, particularly that our, our life as we as we we stand and sort of just a, make an assessment today we are surrounded by conflict where it is like in the finest purest sense of the word our life is a conflict zone we know no peace i ask jesus for each and every person who is here that needs the peace that surpasses all understanding the peace that that comes from heaven the peace of the prince of peace I ask Jesus that you would impart that peace right now in this moment. Settle the storm. Speak shalom from the, from the bow of the boat to the, to the storm and calm the wind and the waves. Bring peace 
to our lives and our hearts. Bring peace to our anxiety, bring, bring peace in the midst of our, our darkness and despair, our depression. Bring peace. Would you release peace, Jesus? Release your peace. Some, you're here, you don't know, you don't have peace in your life, you don't have peace in your heart because you're either far from Jesus or you don't know Jesus. And if you'd like some peace in your heart, come back to him. Say, Jesus, I return to you. My life is, uh, is a mess. Chase him down like Zacchaeus did. Chase him down to the end of the street and climb up a tree. Yell his name, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Like blind Bartimaeus in the street. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Cry out for the Lord's mercy. If you don't know him, just say, Jesus, I, my life is a wreck. It's the, it's the storm on the water. It's the dumpster fire. It's just, a, it's a complete and utter mess. Would you come into my life and bring peace? I pursue you. I follow you, Jesus. I make you Lord and King. The Bible says if you want to start a relationship with Jesus, basically it's to repent and believe and have faith that Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins. And then on the third day, he conquered death by raising himself back to life. And then he sends the Holy Spirit to restore us, to reconcile us to God, to restore us as God's image bearers in this world. People that can represent him, that show the world what he is like. We thank you, Jesus. For the rest of us, God, help us to be a people of peace. Empower us by your Holy Spirit. Give us wisdom, divine wisdom. The wisdom that is, as James says, is pure and comes from above that has good fruit, that is merciful, that is kind, that is gracious, that is not self-seeking, is not ambitious, that seeks to lay down your life for those who have no peace and who need to know peace. Empower us, Holy Spirit, to live in this world out of that divine wisdom. Thank you, Lord. We give you thanks. We give you praise. If you're here today and you'd like somebody to pray with you or you'd like to know more about a relationship with Jesus, our ministry team will be down front after service. They'd love to have a conversation with you or pray for you. Um, God bless.